Hello again. I'm glad you joined me. Today we're going to talk about one thing that we can all do, and that is to pray. I don't know about you, but my prayer life has been different while I've We've all been in this uh, isolation, or I've been in isolation. I've found myself uh, more concerned about other things than just the virus, but the concern about people that have caught it, yes, and the people in the front lines that are working to take care of those, the, the huge decisions our leaders are trying to make, um, the financial crisis that's coming, and, and it's there for some families, and and for others who are living in sad family situations and yet cooped up to try to deal with it, there's just so much more to pray about than just the virus. And if I can say it this way, we sometimes forget that we need to be praying wider and larger. We get to thinking about just our own little uh, puny lives and our little bubble of me, mine, and, and my own and, and not think about anyone else. But we really need to be challenged to think more about praying for other people. So today I thought that's what we kind of look at. I just completed reading a, a book by Mark Batterson called The Circle Maker and I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed it so much that I caught myself copying many, many quotes from his book into my journal. But the one thing that I really that caught me is he talked about praying through. And that's something my grandparents used to talk about and I remember hearing sermons about it. but. I got to thinking I haven't heard anybody talk about praying through for a really long time. And I don't know, is that because we're just not good prayers anymore or that we lack the faith to believe that God can do such a thing, um, that he can answer and give us an assurance of his answer before we actually see it? Or do we live so much by faith that even in our prayers we, we have to see it before we can believe it? Well, by definition, praying through is when you hear God say, stop praying about it and start praising me for it. And it's not name it and claim it, as some people talk about. It's a solid assurance that God has answered your prayer and you can move forward by faith knowing that God has everything in hand. It's like when the centurion came to Jesus because his servant was ill and he told Jesus, you don't need to come with me, just say the word and I know you, you will do the, what you say. And so it's like he knew that God would answer his prayer without Jesus coming to the house. And so he walked away, not even having a confirming word from home, believing that God had answered his prayer already. Well, as I thought more about my prayers and about what we would talk about today, I found myself going through my journals and looking back at different quotes and different things that I'd written down and things I'd copied out years ago. And I, so I thought I'd I uh, wanted to share with you some things from two books that really uh, made an uh, indent, <laughs> that really made an impression on my prayer life. And the first one is T.W. Hunt's book, The Life-Changing Power of Prayer. Here's what he writes. Only one kind of greatness is taught in the Bible, and that's spiritual greatness, and its main characteristic is prayer. Isn't that lovely? And here's how my journal reads. I'm going to be pretty honest with you right now. It says... This caught my attention. My desire for a strong prayer life usually gets sidetracked by two things. A crisis that interrupts my regular devotion time. Though I pray more through a crisis, it is not as ordered. It's like praying on the run. And my own laziness. When things get calmer, I can get more interested in just pottering around instead of getting down to the real work of prayer. And my desire for any sort of spiritual greatness may be more of a selfish lust than a godly desire. There's a fine line there. I have to ask my, myself the question, why do I want spiritual greatness anyway? To show off? To stroke my pride? To have bragging rights? Or am I looking for stronger communion with God? More power for the work? Or for Christ to be manifested and souls to be saved? To be honest, seeking to gain spiritual greatness is a ridiculous concept. I am a desperado I can't make myself spiritual or great, but here's what I can do. I can pray. My journal went back to recording events and thoughts from several other things for a few days, but then I found I recorded another quote from the same book. T.W. Hunt writes, Why should we pray if God already has everything planned? It's a good question, isn't it? Do my prayers really change anything? Have you ever wondered that? I know I have. God ordains all events, the outcomes, and the initiators. 
The sun shines because God has ordained it to do so. It shines because God has ordained it to contain fire that causes it to glow. And he's talking about cause and effect. Prayer, too, has cause and effect. Answers to prayer, which is the effect, come because God has ordained someone to pray about it. That's the cause. And that just might be me. Oh, let me interject here. I love that thought. God ordains that I pray. He places someone or something on my heart to pray about that's a part of his plan. Isn't that amazing? Well, the quote goes on. So we are intricately a part of God's plan. Hence we read in Revelation 5.8 at the final judgment, Herein are the prayers of the saints which are poured out before the throne. So even the end of the world, the recorded and the predestined involves our prayers and they are stored up as a sweet odor before God. Isn't that lovely? Our prayers are stored up as a sweet odor before God. So I should pray for all things as I'm led by the Spirit, even if I know God has already planned it, even if it thinks to be, seems to be something way out of my realm because my prayers are a part of God's plan. They are tools for His glory. They are weapons and reminders of faith. When I think of spiritual greatness, power in prayer is a definite article. And as I see it through the lens of T.W. Hunt, I am challenged to even pray more. Even if this current problem seems so much bigger than me, even if I am only a speck on the face of this planet, my prayers have power and purpose, and so do yours. They are ordained of God. Isn't that amazing? They are part of his plan. Maybe that's why Samuel said in, in uh, 1 Samuel 12, 13, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. He knew the value of his prayers. Do we? And the other really good book on prayer is Life's Limitless Reach by Jack Taylor. And this one turned my prayer life around many years ago. And I go back to it over and over, remembering things that he shared and coming back to it for reference once again. He talks about praying through and he talks about why we should pray and the fact that God ordains that we pray. But probably the most wonderful thing that I pulled from his book is that prayer is the work of the ministry. Without prayer, he writes, there is no worship. There are only two ways, he says, by which we can get to know God. One is through his word and the other is through prayer. But the fact is that while the word contains facts about God, only prayer and the prayerful use of the word is the way that we get to know God. The more we know him, the higher our praise and our prayers. Prayer is work, he says. Unfortunately, he defines, in our modern day, in practice, if not in precept, prayer is pitted against work as its foe. Oswald Chambers says it well. Prayer does not fit us for the greater work. Prayer is the greater work. I loved that too. It makes me remind myself that when I'm on my knees, that's what I'm supposed to be doing. I should not get distracted by my to-do list. Prayer is my to-do. It is the real work that I do each day. And he says, with real prayer is work, and without prayer, there is no work. That reminded me of many Bible stories where people went to do things, even good things, but they failed to ask God first and everything fell apart, didn't it? We must take on the work of prayer. Unless we bathe our ministries and our lives in prayer, we are going out unprotected, vulnerable, and powerless. Prayer is not only work and worship, but he says it's also warfare. And I love this quote. True prayer moves in a circle. It begins with the heart of God and sweeps down into the human heart on earth, so intersecting the circle of the earth, which is the battlefield of prayer, and then goes back up to its starting point, having accomplished its purpose on the downward swing. When we pray, we give God a footing in the battle. You know, there's much more I could share with you today about prayer, but let me encourage you, dear friend, do pray. It's one thing we all can do. We can get into our closets and we can wage war and we can pray for our leaders and for those in need and pray wider and larger, bigger than ourselves. So many people need our work of prayer. So leave the spiritual greatness to God and do the one thing that you can do. Pray. God is waiting to hear from you.